Um, welcome to the database and the data analytics session. This is, of course, a very important area, but not an entirely new area. But today we have three excellent speakers, and they're going to talk about some of the new, very new directions uh, that the field is taking. So one common thread among them is the intersection of this field with some of the techniques in machine learning. The first two talks that we are going to hear are going to be around leveraging some of these uh, deep analytic techniques uh, for some of the classical database operations uh, and challenges. Um, the last talk is going to focus on saying how can data analytic platforms who are of course for a long time and traditionally have been used to understand uh, what the data is, what the insights in the data is, uh, can more easily adapt to the challenges of doing machine learning um, on these platforms. So with these three talks, you're going to see both dimensions of the work that's going on in the field, which is quite new. So with that, we're gonna start with the first speaker, who is Andy Pavlo, Professor Andy Pavlo um, uh, is in CMU, and he is the leader of the database group and the parallel database laboratory there. Um, he's a winner of the Sigmod 2014 Jim Gray Dissertation Award, uh, as well as <coughs> the Sloan Research Fellowship Award for 2018, and ACM Sigmod Best Paper Award. Um, in addition to doing excellent and innovative work uh, in database systems, uh, Andy is one of the most, you know, entertaining speaker, uh, and he has promised us to kick off this session on a high note. With that, Andy, take it away. That's not, I promised you that I wouldn't get you fired. That's what I promised you. Um, that promise is also very important. Okay. And my manager is in the audience, so I have to be particularly careful. Right, so. okay, all right. Yes. All right, thanks, Sergio. All right, so today's talk, I want to talk about so the, the you know, research we've been doing at Carnegie Mellon in the context of how to build autonomous or self-driving database systems. So by autonomous, I mean a database that's able to configure, tune, and optimize itself automatically without any human intervention. So uh, there's another talk I could give about the machine learning methods and algorithms we use to make this happen. Uh, instead, this talk, I want to talk about the things you need to have when you're building your database system in order to make it amenable to being tuned by a, you know, uh, an autonomous component or planning framework. So the way to sort of think about this is, uh, for this talk is like, these are the engineering problems we have to overcome in order to have the machine learning stuff be able to control us, right? It doesn't matter how great your machine learning algorithms are, how much training data you have, if you actually cannot expose the right uh, interfaces or API to those planning frameworks and then take the actions that they suggest and apply them, then all of it's for nothing. So today's talk, I'm gonna break it into three parts. So first, we'll talk about some background of what uh, kind of work's been done in the context of autonomous databases uh, for the last 40 years. And then we'll talk about more of the engineering side of things, uh, again, how to support autonomous operation and then what kind of database talk would I give if we didn't finish off with a rant about Oracle, right? So we'll finish up with that. So uh, the, the idea of autonomous databases are almost as old as databases themselves, right? The, the first relational databases when they came out in the 1970s, immediately people recognized that th there, there was a need for these systems to be able to adapt themselves and uh, optimize the, the performance of, of storage and indexing without having a human tell it everything. So back then, in the 1970s, this line of work was called self-adaptive systems, right? And they did things like picking indexes. It's probably the most common one. So at a high level, these early self-adaptive tools were, uh, work a lot like they work today, uh, you, where you have some human prepare a workload trace of previous queries that the applica application has executed, and then you're going to feed them into your tuning algorithm, which then is going to crunch on them, compute some kind of internal statistics about the, you know, the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're trying to pick indexes, you'll figure out what columns are accessed the most often in queries. And then you use this internal total cost model to evaluate a bunch of candidate actions or candidate indexes and then weight them accordingly. And then the tool would, rec would spit out a recommendation to a human who then had to make the final decision about how and when to apply it to, to the database. So at a high level, again, all of these sort of self-adapted tools work essentially the same way. Right? So they handle things like index selection, data partitioning, sharding, and data placement. So just to give you an idea of how old this problem is, uh, there's a paper in 1976 uh, on doing uh, self-adapted systems for index selection. And this paper was actually written by my advisor's advisor, who is now dead. Right? So this, again, people have been thinking about this for a long time. So now, the next sort of major trend or chapter in autonomous systems came along in the, uh, the 19, late 1990s and 2000s. And this has sort of entered the era of what I'll call for self-tuning database systems. 
All right, and again, at a high level, these tools are essentially doing the same thing. You take some workload trace, crunch on them, and then you spit out recommendations. So all the major vendors at this time had their own proprietary tools to solve these types of problems. Um, and I'm not just saying this because we're here at Microsoft, but it's my opinion that the auto admin project by Microsoft was at the vanguard, really at the forefront of this. And there's a lot of great groundbreaking work that we're actually building on uh, today that came out of this project. And the seminal paper would be this 2007 paper from, from, uh, from Surgit. It sort of talks about the, the, the decades worth of work they did on this project. So the other thing we saw in the self-tuning systems around this time was the need to do knob configuration. So a knob would be like a, a, a configuration parameter you could set in the system to control the runtime behavior of, of the database, like how much memory to use for uh, your buffer pool. And so the reason why there, we had, there was now a, a need for automatic tools to be able to configure these things is because the number of knobs that these systems actually supported kept increasing and things were getting more complex. To give you an idea how bad it is, one of my students went and looked, uh, took uh, the two major open source databases, MySQL and Postgres, and went back 15 years and looked at all the different releases and counted the number of knobs that they had. And over a 15 year period, Postgres increased the number of knobs by 5x, and MySQL increased the number of knobs they had by 7x. So at this point, like, you know, this is well beyond what any human can reason about. And so there's automated tools that are needed to make this happen. So now we see in the 2010s, I'll call what we enter the era of cloud-managed databases. And this is exactly what we just saw in this keynote, where it was not so much about how to tune individual databases, it was now at a service provider level, how to essentially do a bin packing problem, right? How to, to, to place the tenants on the various hardware that you have available in order to maximize the, the performance while minimizing your hardware costs. And you may need to actually migrate things over time. So this is, getting, this is doing autonomous databases, but at the service provider level or the operator level, where you're not actually tuning individual databases, you're just looking at thousands and thousands of tenants and trying to decide what's the best way to lay them out. So now, given I just spent uh, you know, this time in the beginning, talk about the last 40 years of autonomous databases, why, do I, why is all this work that, that people have done before, why is this insufficient for ach achieving fu a fully autonomous system? And I'll say there's three reasons why this, this, is not, uh, this is not entirely what we need. So the first is that a lot of these tools still require a human to make a, a final judgment about the recommendations or suggestions from these, these tuning tools. Right? So a human had to look and say, well, it's asking me to build this index. Is that actually the right thing for me to do? And then the human actually had to then decide when was the right time to deploy that suggestion and, uh, and how should they deploy it. So they'd have to know that like 3 a.m. on a Sunday is when my, I have the lowest amount of demand. So that's when I go ahead and start optimizing things. The, act, the, the next problem is that these are all reactionary measures. Uh, where a lot of them are reactionary, meaning they look at the workload trace in the past, identify problems, and try to come up with suggestions to avoid, to avoid them in the future. But they're not looking down the road, looking at various trends and saying, well, this is my, what my workload's going to look like a week from now or a month from now, and prepare the system accordingly. And this is essentially what humans are doing now, right? They do capacity planning based on what they think is the workload is going to look like in the future. And the last problem is that they're not uh, be able to transfer any of the knowledge that they learn from tuning one particular database and apply it to another database. So what that means is that, say, I run my tuning tool or my, my single database instance, and then I come along with an, uh, another application that I want to tune its database for. Unless that application is exactly, you know, has exactly the same workload on the exact same hardware, you're not, you can't reuse anything you learned from, from the first time you ran it. So, these are the reasons why I think these, all the existing work is not enough to be, in order to have a fully autonomous system. So now you may be asking, why am I so confident that th it's going to be different this time? So I would say that the reason why I'm, I'm optimistic about our ability to have a fully autonomous system is essentially the same story of why machine learning is hot now. Right? We have the storage capacity to actually store a lot of training data. And then we have better frameworks like Torch and TensorFlow be able to crunch on it. And then we have uh, hardware accelerators like GPUs and TPUs available to us to be able to take a large amounts of this training data and, and derive the models that, that we need. So this is why I, I'm, I'm sort of bullish on this area. And I think that there's a lot of interesting techniques from machine learning and the AI community that we can apply for our databases to essentially complete the circle from what people have done in the past. So to give you an, give you an idea what these sort of, uh, some of these projects look like, I want to talk about two things we've been building at, at Carnegie Mellon for the last couple of years. The first is this thing called OtterTune, which is a knob configuration uh, tuning service. And this is designed to work on existing systems 
like SQL Server, MySQL, and Postgres, and sort of treating them as a black box and trying to figure out what, can we, what information can we derive from them to help our, tune their knobs better. And then we have another database system called Peloton, where we've been building this from scratch, where the idea is to take a sort of a, a clean slate approach at designing a database system in order to make it be uh, uh, managed by an autonomous system. So I'll briefly go over each of these one by one. So as I said, Autotune is a database knob tuning as a service. The idea is you come along with your database installation, you connect it to a service, you upload some metrics, we crunch on them, and then spit back a knob recommendation. And then we apply that, observe your changes, and see whether that helps. And sort of this feedback loop, you get better and better. The key difference about Autotune than all the previous work is that we can actually reuse the information or the, the data we've collected from previous tuning sessions to help speed up tuning newer sessions. So that means if you come along with your application, and we've never seen it before, but we collect some metrics and we look to see, oh, it actually looks very similar to this other application we've tuned in the past. Since we know how to tune that one, now we know how to tune yours. So just as a quick show what, how, what kind of performance we can get, so we did a simple experiment where we took MySQL and Postgres, we ran the TPCC benchmark on a small instance on Amazon, and we're going to compare what Autotune can do against the default configuration you get for these systems versus some open source tuning scripts or the configuration you get from Amazon when you run an RDS. And then lastly, we're also going to compare it against a very expensive human DBAs tuning these uh, two systems manually. So in the case of MySQL, what you see is that the Autotune and the DBA actually uh, perform better than all the other approaches. Now, the reason why the DBA actually beats us here is because this is the top MySQL DBA from Facebook. And there's some knob in MySQL that affects whether you flush every write when you commit a transaction uh, or how aggressive you flush things. And at, at Facebook, they were OK with turning that feature off. So that allows you to get a little bit better performance. This is actually an important point when we talk about the engineering side, because this actually is, is a human judgment that has to be made about whether it's OK to, to reduce the durability of, of, your, of your transactional data. So we blacklisted this uh, knob from Autotune. So we, just, so we purposely said it's not allowed to tune this, and then that's why the, the DBA was actually able to beat us. In the case of Postgres, we see that Autotune actually does, does better than all the other approaches. Right? This is because it's able to find sort of the sweet spot for this particular workload and hardware uh, configuration for tuning uh, the buffer pool size versus the log file size. Right? And this, again, we're up against a very seasoned DBA, and uh, we're able to beat them. Again, the main thing here is that we're, Autotune is doing as good, if not better, than very expensive human DBAs with only training for about, for about an hour. Now, the next project is Peloton. And we're pitching this as the self-driving database system, meaning that we want this thing to be entirely autonomous. Um, so we're building this from the ground up to be, entirely, you know, to be controlled by this self-driving framework we've been building. And the idea here is that we want to see where, you know, what advantage do we have when we have complete control of the entire system uh, it allows us to do things that we could not easily do with Autotune. And what I'll say is that we actually considered maybe using MySQL Postgres initially for this project. What we found is that there's just way too many things that uh, require the system to restart, have other problems that make it not amenable for uh, self-driving operation. So we decided to bite the bullet and write a system from scratch. And there's a whole other talk I could give about the trials and tribulations of building a database system from scratch uh, in academia, which has been quite a journey. So, now I want to talk about uh, what, again, what I'm calling design considerations for autonomous operation. So again, the idea here is that how should you build a database system in order to support uh, itself, have itself be able to con be controlled by a uh, you know, planning framework that wants to run entirely autonomously. So for this, the reoccurring theme that we're going to see over and over again is that these, uh, these engineering decisions we can make are going to help us, re uh, help us uh, reduce the complexity of the solution space for our, our autonomous planning components, right? Because otherwise, we need a lot of training data in order to, to train these models, and it'll take a long time for them to converge to a good solution. So there's some tricks we can do to, sh to reduce the number of choices we have to consider and maximize the reuse of the training data that we want to build upon, and that allows us to get better optimizations more quickly. So I'll first talk to start talking about uh, configuration knobs and metrics. So the idea here is what API or data you expose to the, the planning framework. And then we'll talk about how do you take the actions that the planning framework suggests and apply them in an efficient manner without slowing down the, the, the rest of the system. 
All right, so the most important thing uh, that you have to have for your configuration knobs is the ability to mark which ones should or should not be tuned by your autonomous components. Right? We saw this before when we talked about the Facebook DBA. Right? There's some flag that Facebook allowed the, their DBAs to set that we decided that we weren't going to set in our autonomous components because a human had to make a final value judgment about whether it was OK to do that. Right? So some things are obvious, right? like file paths, network addresses, and port numbers. Right? If you don't set these things, then the system doesn't, doesn't boot properly at all. But things like durability and isolation levels, these are actually judgments that have to be made by the company organization about whether that was an OK thing to do. Right? Is it OK to turn off F-Sync when you commit a transaction? Right? Are you OK with losing maybe the last 10 and 20 milliseconds worth of transaction data? Some places that's OK, some places that's not OK. But the, the, the machine learning algorithms aren't going to know that. There's some other more nuanced things like hardware usage, like how aggressive do you want to be doing compaction if you have an LSM, because this will cause you to wear down the device more quickly and have to buy new hardware. Um, or recovery time is another one. Like, do you, do you, how long are you willing to have the system be able to you know, take to recover if there's a crash? We can't, we can't control these things, or we can't know these things in our machine learning model across models. So we have to have a human just be able to tell this. And we have to, therefore, we, we should blacklist them. The next one is that uh, we need now hints about how we should actually tune these knobs. And again, this is necessary, again, to, to reduce the, the search space or solution space of the actions that we can apply in our system. So the most obvious one is, uh, is our min-max ranges for a parameter. Right? What's the, you know, how, many, how, much, how much memory should I be able to allow to allocate to a buffer pool? There's other things we see that anytime you have a knob where you, that you think can be controlled, meaning turn it on and off, uh, you should always separate them from the actual knob that controls its behavior. So sometimes we see knobs where you can, you can rate limit how, much, how fast it's going to write data out the disk in terms of kilobytes. But a lot of times they'll use a special value like negative 1 or 0 to disable that feature. Now the problem is the machine, lear the machine learning algorithms will find that setting the, you know, the, the amount of data you're writing out the disk to 0 kilobytes makes you go faster. Uh, but of course that, now that means you're not writing data to disk and you're going to lose data. So if you just have a separate Boolean flag to control it separately from the actual uh, parameter, that makes things easier. Another more nuanced one is, is the ability to control how you actually modify these, these values or knobs. So in most cases, or in most systems we've seen, you can set absolute values for, for a certain parameter. Like how much memory do you want to use for your buffer pool, you can set it from 0 to 2 to 32. We think the better way to do this is just Increment have increments that can, are based on a delta that go up and down for these parameters, and that cuts down the number of actions you have to consider. But now the problem is, if you have a you know a large uh, range of values you could, you could you could choose, then incrementing by a fixed amount over you know in, throughout that entire range causes problems. So what you really want is non-uniform deltas like this. So say if I want to set the amount of memory I'm using for my buffer pool, if I have between one kilobyte and one megabyte, maybe just increment by hundred kilobytes at a time. Right? But if I'm up to one terabyte of DRAM, I don't want to increment by one kilobytes because it's not going to make a big difference from, from one setting to the next. So you can, you can expose these deltas to the tuning algorithms and say only increment by these values when you're within these ranges. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is how do you expose metrics or information to the outside system. And we're going to use these to, to build our cost models and do, do reward calculations for our actions we can choose. So the most important thing we find is that any time your database system supports the ability to tune individual subcomponents, uh, you want to make sure you expose individual metrics for those subcomponents. So an example would be in like DB2, for example, you can set the number of buffer pools you want, and for each buffer pool you can tune them separately. And you need to make sure that for each buffer pool, all the stats you, you care about are, are, are exposed to you and not sort of aggregated together. The biggest offender we find is actually for this is RocksDB. So in RocksDB, you can set uh, for each table, can have multiple column families, right? And you can tune each column family individual, individually. So they do expose they do expose some metrics about each column family, but the problem is the most important thing you need to, to determine whether your performance is going to get better or worse are the number of reads and writes per column family, but they're not included in the in in the sort of the subcomponent metrics. Instead, you can only get this from from a global metric table, where it's been combined together. So now you need a lot of training data in order to, to determine whether the changes you're making to a, one particular column family is benefiting or hurting you, because you have to then extract that from the, the aggregated uh, metric. 
So now we can talk about how do you actually take the actions that the, the algorithms select and apply them efficiently. So the most important thing I would say, and part of the reason why with Peloton we decided to build a system from scratch, is that we find that in many cases changing a knob or, or applying an action requires you to restart the system in order that to take effect. Now the commercial systems are much better than this than the open source guys, but even you know, the SQL Server, Oracle, and DB2, there's enough knobs in there that require you to have to restart. The reason why that's problematic is because now you need to take into consideration in your cost models the, the time it takes to restart the system. Or you have to ask a human whether it's okay to restart the system right now. So we think that there should be never any knob that would require you to have to restart. And this includes scaling up the hardware as well as applying you know, changes that modify how it actually uses the hardware. Another very important thing is that uh, you want to have the ability to have your replicas converge or have, or sorry, diverge and have different configurations in order to get more training data about the different configurations you could have. All right, so a very common setup in databases is that you, for high availability, you have a master and some replicas, right? And any time the master goes down, then you elect one of the replicas to become the new master. So normally, you would have these things have the exact same configuration because any time the master goes down, you want the replica to be able to come up right away. But instead, what you can do to get more training data, you could have the master have the best configura configuration you've ever seen, but then your replicas, you're trying out other configurations to see whether they're actually better than, than what's on the master right now. So in this case here, the replicas could be trying out different index selections and seeing whether they're actually improving performance. So let's say for this top guy here, this is actually doing better then we can recognize that it's OK for us to deploy this on the master. Right? And the reason why we want to do this on the replica is because we don't want to slow down the, the, the master node, because we need to meet our SLAs and SLOs. So now the problem is, though, let's say that this bottom guy here, we're trying out a configuration that actually is bad, and therefore uh, we're falling behind the, the, the workload that's on the master. Right? So if we recognize now, if, if we're too far behind, we want to go ahead and kill that uh, configuration and restart the system, right? Because we don't want to have to crash. If, if the master crashes, we don't want our replica to have to take five minutes to get caught back up, because now that's downtime we have to include in our system. Yes, five, perfect. So there's a bunch of other stuff you have to consider for this. Like, you know, can you, if you're in a cloud environment, can you scale out additional VMs to collect more training data? How do you jitter the workloads so you're, you, the, the input sequence to the replicas are, are different, right? So there's a whole bunch of systems questions to actually make this work, I think is interesting. So to finish up, let's talk about Oracle. So you might have seen this announcement uh, last year where Oracle came out and says, uh, we have the world's first self-driving database management system. Larry Ellison got on stage and he said, this is the most important thing that the Oracle, Oracle Corporation has worked on in the last 20 years. So the only thing about this announcement is that we had a paper in January, a few months before, where we talked about our self-driving database system. Right? And at no point did Larry Ellison mention our work. So I decided to you know, shoot him an email and be like, hey, look, what's up with that? Right? Now, you may be thinking it's a bit puerile for a professor to email somebody and say, hey, why didn't you cite our work? But Larry Ellison and I go, go pretty far back. Uh, and so I thought it was OK for me to email and let him know that I was slightly displeased with this. Now, he didn't respond to this email. Uh, he never responds to any of my emails. Uh, but that's okay. We, we, can still, we can still break it down and see what he's actually done. So their self-driving database claims that they have four key features. They do automatic indexing, recovery, scaling, and query tuning. Now, for the first three items here, these are essentially the same things, the same, solving the same kind of problems that the self-tuning databases were solving in the 2000s, right? And so in talking with the Oracle developers and reading their marketing material, as far as I can tell, these are just the same tools that they've been selling before as DBAs, for the DBAs, but now just running them in a managed environment. So that means they have the same limitations or problems that I talked about before, where they're reactionary and they're not able to do knowledge transfer. So for this reason, I don't think this is actually really a self-driving database, right? They're just running your stuff automatically and sort of playing tricks underneath the covers to make it look like it's, it's you know, fully adaptive and self-driving. So now for the second part, the last one, automatic query tuning, if you're familiar with the work in academic literature, this is usually referred to as adaptive query processing. But the idea is if you have a very expensive query, uh, you run it through the optimizer when you first start, you generate a query plan, and if you notice over time as you're running it, things are not, it's not as, as good as you thought it was, then you run through the optimizer again. So this is not unique to Oracle, right? Microsoft announced last year in SQL Server 2017 that they have the same feature. 
But it's even older than that, right? If you go back into the early 2000s, IBM DB2 had a project called Leo, the learning optimizer, where they were essentially doing the same kind of thing. But it's even older than, than, than the IBM project. It actually goes back to the 1970s with the first, one of the first relational databases, Ingress, where they were essentially do, they were running the query optimizer over and over again for every single tuple you would examine. And they did this not because they were trying to be sophisticated. They were doing this because they, they had a really primitive query optimizer. So again, in this case here, there's nothing really unique about what Oracle is claiming they can do. Um, and I wouldn't say that this, this is self-driving at all. So what I will say, though, about Oracle is in talking with the developers, they are working on a newer version of this that is certain to incorporate some of the things that I'm talking about here. So to finish up, I think that autonomous databases are achievable in the next decade. I think it's a lot of engineering work, a lot of systems research, and a lot of machine learning stuff we can apply to sort of make this thing all work. And I would say for anybody that's working on a large system, they, they want to have be used, whether, either it's in academia or in industry, anytime you add a new feature, you should not think about how, how is a human going to tune this. You should really be thinking about how can a machine tune this in an efficient manner. Am I exposing the right information and the right controls that are necessary to make this thing work? So with that, I'll finish up. And I don't think we have any questions, right? Because we're going to do a panel afterwards. OK? Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Uh, just hang in for a second. Uh, let's see uh, if there are a couple of pointed questions that anybody in the audience has for Andy. Uh, before the memory of the talk fades a bit with the next two talks. Uh, so if you have any question, though, raise your hand. Uh, there are runners who will give you a microphone because these talks are being recorded. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just repeat the question if that makes it easier. Yeah. Andy, thanks for the great talk. Um, so you mentioned a bunch of driving factors that are being like available of new hardware and available of um, new interesting ways of doing more powerful models, um, such as Steve Nets. But I mean, from, from my experience, one of the big differentiators is also the availability of new data or, or more data that allows us to do better training and therefore um, build better and, and more expressive models. And so I'm wondering, um, where do you get your data from? And do you have any interesting insights of um, how to do better and more targeted data collection and selection for training better models um, in this context? All right, so his question is that, so Johannes is arguing that the Having a lot of training data is the, is the key thing to having you know, models that actually can, can, that we can derive use from. So what are some things we can do to improve our, the collection of training data? Is that correct? Yeah. OK. So the, the one thing I, I, would, I said before is about this example here. Like if you use your replicas to try out different configurations, this is collecting more training data. Right? But this is sort of getting, you know, this is helping you to converge to see whether you're actually getting benefit from the choices you make. Um, in terms of the actual metrics, I think that, uh, I mean, you, you essentially, the systems are doing monitoring now. We, we just make sure that we, we push them out and build our models based on them. So there's not really anything in terms of what metrics you collect. Uh, there's not really anything in there that's different than what existing systems do now. In the case of Autotune, we don't actually need to look at the queries or the actual data itself. We just take the metrics, you know, the internal performance counters that the system generates and spits them out. Uh, the other thing I'll say, though, is a lot of times developers just add whatever metric they think of. right? So there's a, there's a lot of data in, you know, that, that's actually not really useful. And so we have statistical methods to sort of prune out the things that actually don't matter and sort of focus on the main ones. And they, they sort of you know, finding the signal and the noise in that way. Carlo, yes. I, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> then you can repeat the question. I will. Uh, so uh, the question is, I, I love the other point. I think it's a great point. And, uh, the, the question is, I think there's a, a fundamental advantage for cloud providers, right? You run millions of databases. So how do you see uh, a way for academia to collaborate with cloud providers? Because we will have the data, and we obviously want to do this kind of research because all of the advantages you described. But how do you? Um, give academia a shot, basically, to, to help us innovate on this, right? Uh, giving out the data is obviously very hard. Do you have any ideas of how, uh, besides interns, you can, you, can, you can make this work? Otherwise, uh, you end up like the web search, and there's, there's one or two companies in the world who do it, and everyone else kind of talk about something else. So which company are you working for, <laughs> or are you in the academia recently joined? <laughs> <laughs> I think the advantage for us, right, is just wondering how we can play 
All right. So I think Carlos' question is how how should academics engage with major cloud vendors like like Microsoft and try to apply some of these techniques in in your environment? Um, I would say that. So this is sort of why we, I sort of divided my two projects and taking existing systems versus like the building system from scratch. I for the for the kind of tuning we want to handle on AutoTune, you need to have the source code. You need complete control of everything. So I, I think in, you know, for you guys, it'd be hard, hard to do this. Plus, it, you know, SQL Server is a huge code base. I think that's something you guys have to do in-house. With AutoTune, since we're just looking at sort of treating the database system as a black box, um, I think interns are probably the, the, the right way to do this. I think that. Um, I think that we've learned enough about SQL Server now and other systems that we can come to you guys and say, hey, if you add these features. But I think it's going to take longer than the, th the things we're going to ask you for is going to take longer than you can do in a summer internship. So I don't know what the right approach is for that. So I would just add one small thing that it is true that we get a lot of telemetry data. Yes. There's no question. But as you know, we are not allowed to look at the data or the workload. So there is, you know, even though there is a lot of data in our cloud service somewhere, yes. we are not entitled to look at it, uh, the query string or actual data, unless you know the customer has raised a ticket and for a limited time in an audited way, somebody looks at it, right? Mm -hmm. So it comes with the other balancing thing on our ability to look at, you know, in a classical way to look at all the data like Bing or Google can do, we can't do. I think just wanted to add that. So as an aside, I will say that, again, just like, I mean, I'm not just here because he's here. Yeah. Just the way that auto admin was sort of the leader in this area of, in the 2000s, in my visits with, with companies, I think Microsoft, again, is in the cloud area, is, is leading the, this effort, right? I'm actually surprised at how primitive some of the things that are, that are out there in, in major cloud vendors in this area. Uh, well, last question. Thanks, Andy. Uh, and then maybe the last question, and then we'll... We can't hear you, but I think the microphone is not on. I think that microphone. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. I'll just repeat uh, it. Right. Okay. Uh, so my question was that you mentioned that there was an increase in the number of configuration knobs in these various database engines by about a factor of five over the years. But it's likely that most of the features don't really affect the performance as such, right? In the sense that the same three or four important parameters that were there 10 years back would probably be the same ones that you have right now. So actually only the DBA needs to look at those parameters and the rest of them are just, as you mentioned, noise amongst the signal. And if you're using machine learning techniques, it's likely that you will introduce many new features that are actually not relevant towards the final goal of uh, uh, optimizing the system for performance. So his question is that uh, in this graph here, I'm showing that there's hundreds of knobs, but in actuality, most of them are, are probably not something that a DBA is going to tune actively or you know tune for the in you know, a daily job. Um, and then, then you were saying that if now we start introducing, uh, you know, interfacing the data system with machine learning pieces or machine learning components, that's going to introduce more knobs and more complexity. And how do we handle that? So, uh, for so the first one, I would say that what we do in 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 AutoTune is that we we basically run a similar lasso of regression and figure out here's the ranking of the knobs that actually matter the most for a variety of workloads. And you're right, it's about 25 or so. But I would say that it's, it's more than just the number of knobs, it's the dependencies between them. And that just makes the problem, you know, it's just that's more, much more difficult. So um, then the second thing you said was that adding in machine learning parts just makes this thing even, even harder to tune. Um, I would say, but yes, but these are things not that, I, I, these are things I, I mean, it's my lofty research goal is I think we can automate all of this. I don't think we actually need humans to do very, very much other than to give us a credit card number and uh, some initial hints about how to tune things. I don't think there's anything that uh, you know, we would need a human to tune these things for. So that's, that's my goal. Whether we get there you know, you know, in 10 years, uh, I'd like to think we can, but we'll see. Well, on that high note, yes. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Tim Kraska from MIT. Uh, Tim you know, has been in our field of database systems for a long time, and uh, his research has focused in the past on hybrid 
I guess in the present as well, human machine database systems and big data management. Um, most recently though, he has been uh, taking a really bold agenda, which is to go and look at the database systems architecture, which, you know, is not exactly young, um, and say that maybe using data and, you know, machine learning techniques, we can take a hard look at these components and see um, how can they be re-architected? You know, how can they be even better than what it has been traditionally? And um, I think we're going to hear some of that today. Uh, I also wanted to say that he has um, had many awards. I'll mention some of them. He has the IEEE Data Engineering Best Paper Award in 2013, um, and the Sloan Fellowship Award 2017, and most recently, he's the winner of the 2018 VLDB Early Career Research Contributions Award. With that, Tim, take Thank it away. You. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, can you all hear me, like in the back as well? It's all good? Perfect. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is actually a paper we published uh, this year in Zigmod called uh, like the case for learned index structures. Half of the talk, like uh, if you have seen it maybe before, like particularly the Microsoft people, you know it already. However, I also added some new stuff we did on multidimensional index, uh, indexes for the second half. So you can fall asleep for the first 10 minutes. Um, so the work like we, we published at Zygmunt, um, it actually went like viral last year. Uh, and it all started with a tweet by Christopher Manning saying that machine learning just ate algorithms in, in one large bite. Uh, I just want to give you a disclaimer here up front. We by no means believe that machine learning is or has eaten uh, the whole field of algorithms and data structures. Uh, however, we do believe maybe it has like a, taken a little bite from it. And there's a lot of more interesting work to be done. So. Why were people so excited about it? Um, the fundamental building blocks essentially of all systems, uh, in particular also data management systems, are data structure and algorithms. And we have a whole range of really of these fundamental data structures from sorting, uh, different sorting algorithms, hash maps, different types of indexes, priority queues, and so on. All these data structures have in common that they essentially make no assumptions about the data. So now let me give you just a very simple example. Let's assume that in your database system, you want to store and query all the integers from 900 to 800 million. And you are interested in range queries for them. You are looking into like, OK, scanning, for example, all the integers from 100 to something, and they're recording records. Right? So a very simple example. Uh, in this particular case, probably nobody here would actually use a B tree for it. Right? Because it's just like there's, you know that it has all the integers in that range. Instead, what you could do is have instead uh, for an index structure, uh, just like the lookup key itself as an offset. So what you do is just like look up into your data store, the lookup key minus 900, the off, uh, which gives you the offset, and you can Im immediately start reading. Right? Because you know something about the data distribution. So now assume that you store all even integer numbers from 900 to 800 million. And the same trick still works. Right? You take the lookup key, minus 900 divided by 2, which gives you again the offset, and you can look at it immediately up. So what we did here is essentially like we had to be true before, which has like a log n lookup time. Right? So you need to traverse this, and now transform it to something which is essentially O of 1. This still holds to, true for other uh, data distributions, as long as you know the empirical data distribution and can compactly represent it. So the key insight is that uh, if we take this like black box of the data and now just like make it a white box by saying like, okay, if you know something about your empirical data distribution, about the data you store, um, you can build much, much better data structures for them. And in some cases, even transform the com uh, complexity class. Now, obviously, it's not like efficient to build one system from scratch for every single use case you have. Right? This is not economical. But this is exactly where machine learning comes in because it provides us a toolbox to learn these types of models and then take afterwards advantage of them. So here I will use B-trees as the main example. And just for simplicity right now, um, I assume that we have an in-memory immutable B-tree with no inserts and no paging. Just like for simplification, I will talk about inserts and paging later on. So if you think what a B-tree actually does is like given a key, the B-tree finds you the position inside the sorted array. Normally, we, we page the sorted array 
meaning that we put it into different pages. Uh, and then, for example, we only index the first key inside the page uh, just for like efficiency reasons that the B tree doesn't blow entirely up. Right? So in that sense, what the uh, B tree does, given a key, it finds me the page. And then I need to search inside the, the page to find the actual key. So it's already an approximate data structure, because given a key, you get the position inside the sorted array. And then you have to search inside the, the page size. right? So it's a guarantee that you will find it there. In that sense, I can actually replace the B tree with a model. As long as I have a key, and the model predicts me the position where this key might be in the, inside the sorted array, I'm good. Now the question is just like the first, OK, how do I still get the guarantee that I can still find my key inside the sorted array? Where is it? Like, so in the previous case, the page defined like the min-max error where to find the key. First of all, it's actually surprisingly simple. So let's assume I have a uh, monotonically increasing model. What that means is just like I can run every key through the model and then look on how far it is off and simply remember the maximum over and under prediction, which gives me a strong error bound. In the end, it turns out that we don't even need that, because given that the whole thing is sorted anyway, I get a prediction, and then I can do something like exponential search to find actually the key right in place, wherever it is, without needing to search everything. So I can get a bound, and then like with the bound, I would do binary search. If I don't have the bound, I could do something like exponential search. So it turns out like what we're actually doing here is the index is like modeling the CDF of the data. So given a key, it finds me the position inside the sorted array, which is nothing else than trying to estimate the probability mass of every key which is equal or less than the key I'm looking up times the numbers of keys I have in total, which gives me the position inside the sorted array. This insight is interesting because this allows us to take advantage of this like, whole literature out there on how like, CDFs can be modeled. Even more interesting is that a B tree itself can also be seen as a model already. It's a form of a regression tree, and it's just like a special form of it, which has like a special structure, but it's also a model. Right? So there's nothing, even what we do right now, you can actually see as models. It's just, I'm just saying you can use other things as well. So what does it mean, and that makes potentially some people here very, very happy, that is database people were actually the very first to do large-scale machine learning. Right? Because we were the first to do like large B trees, which is nothing else when I just showed you than building a model. So what might be the potential of using like other models than the normal regression trees or B trees? And there are a whole bunch of them. First of all, um, they might lead to smaller indexes. Um, if we, for example, in the case before, if we know we have all the integers, I can build a much more compact representation of it. The only thing I need is like the offset, maybe an intercept in the slope, and I'm done. Right, so it's much more spa uh, space efficient. I might get faster lookups. I might get more parallelism. And that is mainly because like, in, for many models, I'm transforming like, the very heavy if statements a B tree needs to traverse into multiplications and additions. Um, I might be, taken, uh, be able to take advantage of hardware accelerators. And we heard in the morning already that there's like a lot of excitement going on in building FPGAs, especially for uh, machine learning. So now, by transforming them, I might have an, the advantage uh, to actually leverage them also for database systems. And there are also a chance of like having sh cheaper inserts. I will talk about that later. So we tried that out very early on, like after having this like observation in TensorFlow. So we built like a, a TensorFlow model, uh, two layer of fully connected, 32 vis, relu activated. Uh, we trained it over 200 million web server log records. We wanted to index the timestamp. And essentially, like the goal of the index was give me a timestamp, give me the uh, position inside the sorted array. So a cache optimized B tree for this task roughly takes 250 nanoseconds. Any guesses how long TensorFlow takes? The first attempt, 80,000. So we successfully made it like almost three orders of magnitudes, a little bit more slower, right? So not very successful. The reason for them are very manifold. Like first of all, TensorFlow is designed for very large models, not for this like tiny things which are supposed to run in the range of nanoseconds. Um, 
the search doesn't take advantage that we actually get pretty close by the prediction, but like often our min and max error is very, very large. Whereas like most of the time we're actually close by. So if you binary search, this throws you off. And then like B trees are very, very cache efficient. So if you have a large model, you lose that as well. Plus like they are great for overfitting. And in this case, overfitting, as long as you only have uh, lookups and no inserts is actually a good thing. Because as more you overfit, you better look up your data you have. Here I'm only addressing the last two because I need them later on to explain why, how our multidimensional indexes work. So to overcome the problem that we have like a very efficient way to overfit to something, uh, we came up with this structure which we call the recursive model index. What you, you can best think of it just like as an, um, like an expert model where one model, the top one, picks another model which is an expert for a certain range of the data. Right, so we have one model at the top which takes a key, makes a prediction. Based on the prediction, you pick another model which knows that area better, which might pick another model. Right? So the nice thing about that is it can be very, very efficiently implemented. Right, so let's assume I have a top model, F0. I have a model, models on stage two, which is an array of models. Right? So what I'm actually doing is just like I execute the first model, which gives me an index position into the array of models of the second stage, which I then execute, which gives me the final position if I have a two-stage model. If I now, for everything, don't use neural nets, but let's assume just like linear regression, the whole lookup, as you can see here down here, takes me two multiplies, two additions, and one array lookup. This is the execution of the index. That's it. There's like some code necessary for boundary checks, but it turns out you can also avoid that. Right? You just need to change the, the learning a little bit so that the boundary checks are never necessary. Furthermore, you can in some cases even replace some of the models using normal B trees. Right? So if you say like, okay, in a certain area, the normal linear model or neural net or whatever you are using, everything is fair game. Uh, doesn't work very well, so just replace that piece of it using a normal B-tree and, uh, and you get like the normal guarantees for it. The nice thing of doing that is the worst case performance is in the end is the one of just like the B-tree because in the worst case it just degrades to a B-tree. We started out with that, it turns out like at most of our data sets right now we never use that anymore because the complexity of mixing different models normally doesn't pay off. It's easier to just use more models. So does it have to be neural nets? The answer is clearly no. You can use whatever fits, and this is essentially also what we are doing right now. We normally use very simple linear models, sometimes uh, multivariate models. Uh, in particular cases where more complex data is required, sometimes neural nets, but very simple ones. The neural nets, actually, the most complicated things are the activation function because they are often very expensive to execute on the CPU. So does it work? What we did here is just like we compared a, a cache optimized and read optimized B tree, um, tuned it to get the best lookup performance, and compared it to our learned indexes. And what you see is just like overall we get like uh, up to a factor of two faster and save uh, like up to one order or even more in uh, main memory. We also compared it against other state of the art index structures, for example, fast lookup tables fixed size B-trees with interpolation search. Um, and here it plugs the alternatives in regard to lookup time uh, where the size and the left lower corner is where you want to be. And you can see that like the learned indexes is, is like a dominant solution. So what about like our assumption I did in the beginning about inserts and paging? Uh, first of all, inserts might not be such a big problem in the end. So let's assume that your inserts follow roughly the data distribution what you have learned. In that sense, you don't need to rebalance the model, right? You don't need to change it. You can just reuse the model and make space wherever you want to insert something. This is particularly easy to see if you have mostly like inserts. So let's assume you have timestamps for IoT devices. The timestamps normally increase. They might increase with the same patterns what you have observed in the past. So the model simply generalizes. There's a B tree you have to rebalance all the time. Of course, the big question becomes if it doesn't follow exactly the data distribution, how do you still rebalance? But there's something like robust machine learning which takes care of that. So there are like new approaches there. The question, second question is like paging. Often what we have is just like we want to page the data, particularly if it's on disk. Here one simple solution is actually that you use the model itself to determine the pages. So normally a B tree 
that takes what goes into a page, right? Like if you have an um, index organized table, the index tells you what you should put on the page. You can do the same thing here. And then you get around most of the problems you would have otherwise with paging. So we started with B trees, but it turned out like the same idea also applies to many, many other data structures from join, sorting, hash maps, bloom filters, priority queues. For example, one of my colleagues, Mohamed, is working on uh, new, like, learned scheduling algorithms uh, for data analytics. There's work on cache policies by Google. Um, we are looking into query optimization, what we can do there. Um, there's a whole range where you can apply very similar ideas. Most of the time, it's all about learning the CDF of your data and taking advantage of that. So here, I just want to mention something else, which is multidimensional indexes. So our big hope when we started that actually was not to get like more efficient index structures for a single dimension. Our hope was always like, okay, in the moment we would go multidimensional, we assumed we would see the bigger benefits there. Because what machine learning in general, or like most of the models are really, really good at, is just like capturing all the complex relationships data has, right? So machine learning was just like, predefined to say like, okay, it should perform very well on multidimensional data. The biggest problem we faced in the beginning is just like that, unfortunately, even if we learn all these complex correlations, in the end, there's only one order on disk, which is one dimensional. Of course, you can see like disks are more complex, but like in the end, you have like one order for scanning. And, and this is like a big fundamental limitations on how you deal with that because at some point, it doesn't matter how you do it, you need to transform what you have in the multidimensional space to one order on disk, and this is like in the end what matters, or one order, uh, order you have in main memory. So how can you do that? So let's assume these are like the different data points you have. Let's assume like you have, uh, this is maybe some uh, order data, you have the order amount and order zip code, and those are like two dimensions you make queries for. One approach, you could say like, okay, if the, the two attributes are equally important to you, you project them just to the middle. This is like you can see as a form of PCA because you give each the equal weight and then you have one projection to a one dimensional space and this is like the sorting order you use on disk. And you can immediately see in some cases this is like fine and others this will not work very well. Right? For example, if you know that most of the, the queries you do are for the order amount, and not for the order zip code, the best thing you can actually do is you order all your data in accord, uh, regarding the order amount and disregard the zip code for that. If you mostly look up for zip codes, you would do the opposite. Right? You order everything for zip code, but you ignore the order amount. Right? So there is a trade-off on how you actually serialize the data and how you lay it out. So the interesting thing is we found that you can actually even mix them. For example, you can say like, okay, I project down to zip code, then I built like larger blocks. And now within the block, maybe I want to use a different projection, in this case, order amount. So I first split up into zip codes, and then I project down to order amount. So I have like every block is now ordered within regarding to the order amount. Right? And again, I can trade them off on how they depend. And what's best highly depends on your workload. Right, so if you never touch the zip code, you should probably not order for them because it doesn't provide you any benefit. And this led to our like, final design right now, what we have for multidimensional indexes, is we start out with the data points we have. We have a first model, which is called a projector, which based on the workload projects it into an order we have later on on disk. What we do there is like exactly the trick I showed you before. We allow columns on how we split it down to disk in these like blocks. So we start with a root node, which figures out the general direction of the data depending on like on what queries are most common. Then it projects everything to this dimension, and then we repeat the process and make directions, projections for all the different blocks separately again. Often they are orthogonal to each other just because on how the data is laid out. So we get like, for example, these projections down here, which you can see now like within every block, we have actually a different order of them. And we have a, like models of models again to define or find like some like point in that space later on on the disk. Right? Also interesting, this can be recursed, so you can make it as deep as you want. And this model itself here is the same data structure as what I showed you before for RMI. This is like, again, this like expert model on the top, which picks another expert, which organizes this differently. This, if you have only linear models, 
can be executed again for two stitch models and two multiplies, two additions and one area lockup. So it's extremely fast. However, if we have the projector, it still doesn't give us now like where to find something on in a dense array because like still there might be space in between. So what we do in order to get the dense array is nothing else than what we had before. It's just like build a locator again using an RMI model. And so like we, this is like essentially we have everything in one dimensional space and now we build like the, the same B-tree model what we had before uh, over it. So this is pretty new, um, but some very, very initial like performance number shows it's like pretty promising. So for one million data points right now, we get like uh, roughly 200 nanosecond lookups for point queries. Uh, this is like a speed up of like two to 10 X over um, the R trees, depending on how you configure it, while you have like an order of magnitude space savings. Of course, there's like more to come. We need more workloads. And this is like essentially, this lookup here is without considering the, the workload itself yet because we haven't done that even. So it just assumes everything is uniformly likely, which is actually the worst case scenario for us. Also interesting to notice, this data structure in contrast to an R tree doesn't increase with the numbers of dimensions you have. Instead, it should increase with the rank of the data. So if you have, like for example, at the same attribute again, just a full duplicate, it wouldn't make any change to our layout or the model complexity. So for future work, there's much more to be done. Uh, we are heavily looking into sorting and joining. So essentially what we want to figure out is just like, can we not improve every single component of a database system using models? And how would that look like if you put in the end everything together? And the core insight is that if you have a model, an efficient model about your data distribution, how would you actually build your data structure or algorithm with that? You have an oracle which tells you, okay, the probability mass given for a key in your data set. Probably with this oracle, you would design many of the algorithms and data structures you have in a very, very different way. The other thing is just like it's all about continuous functions. So if you compare that now, for example, to order preserving hashing, perfect hashing, local sensitive hashing, all the different variants you have, like normally they don't take advantage of like the fact that you can with continuous functions much, much better approximate the rough position. So it's like a form of interpolation search, but often done with regression or you can like model more complex shapes. If you do that, you have like data structures which learn automatically adapt to the data you have uh, and they're potentially run on TPUs or GPUs or FPGAs, whatever is your, your preferred machine learning platform. And in some cases can even lower the complexity class for storage as well as lookup time. For example, we saw that in the case of the data area lookup and I can also show you similar things for the multidimensional cases now as well. However, just a warning ahead, this is not an almighty solution, right? There are of course like data sets where still a traditional B-tree might be better. There's like a lot to be done, um, but it's like I think a very exciting direction. I'm also very happy to announce that we are like starting DCEL for uh, data systems for AI Lab at MIT and that Microsoft is like one of our major sponsors for it. It involves like half systems people, half uh, ML people from both sides and the key questions we are investigating is like how we can use machine learning for systems or build systems for machine learning. With that, I think I'm more or less in time. <laughs> I'd like to conclude. So what I showed you is like a new approach for indexing. I think it's a framework to rethink many existing data structures and algorithms. Under certain condi uh, conditions, it might change the complexity class for a particular instance of the data. That's always important to say. And uh, the idea might have implications within and outside database systems. Thank you. Any questions? Ah, there's a question. Peter, Peter has a question. Just, just they'll, they'll get you a microphone. <laughs> I can also repeat it. It's fine. Thank you. Hi. So. Uh, can, can you explain a little bit about what it looks like when you're actually learning these, these models versus the process of building a, a, a B tree? <laughs> so uh, if, you're, you know, if you're doing dynamically maintaining these things on the fly, um, you know, I, it's, it's a little unclear from your talk, you know, kind of what it looks like. How the learning process looks like. It gives you a big blob like. of data, what do you do? 
Right. So like um, the like to create an index, so what I mainly talked here about was only read-only data. So the the simplest thing is just like you sort your data, and then if you use, for example, a two-stage linear model, um, the top model you can train in one pass over the data. Actually, you don't even need the full data; you can skip pieces of it because the sample is often more than enough. Right. So uh, it's just like one pass over it because there's a closed form. There's no gradient descent or anything. Then what you use is like you use the top model, go over all the data points you have, put every data point into the bucket of what expert it belongs on one level down. This is our greedy training approach. And then you, for every bucket, you repeat the process. Um, so like you go over the data as many stages you have. Right? So if you have two-stage models, you have two passes over the data. If you have three-stage models, three passes over the data and so on. Um, it goes extremely fast. Uh, I mean, like uh, a B tree, you can build in one pass over the data if everything is sorted. But like it's, you know, like the first one doesn't it can work on a sample. Um, inserts. There's another paper by uh, Carsten and some of my collaborators, uh, Brown, where we look into on how we can do inserts more efficiently. The easiest way, what you do is just like you have a delta index, right? So instead of doing the inserts every single time, retraining the model, you put them in a delta, and then at some point you figure out if it's worthwhile retraining or merging or whatever. Right. Okay, there's a question uh, back there, Jan. And then there is, Chen has a question. Yeah. Right. So uh, Tim, you were mentioning that you would like to know the CDFs of the uh, uh, single column distributions in advance. And isn't that already given to you by the histograms that most database systems already maintain for these columns? So I didn't uh, see you talking about the interaction between histograms and the machine learning process. Right. Um, so histograms are in the end still very coarse grained. So the question is just like, okay, if you would create a histogram with the granularity you have, we need for actually looking the data up, um, then it's a question, okay, how do you browse the histogram itself? And if you solve that problem, actually what you get is a B tree. And so I can show that you can transform one into the other in, because you need like the lookup structures over it. So histograms themselves don't help you that much. There's something like lookup tables, which is like the thing in between, but like uh, I had numbers for them. They also don't help you that much. The interesting thing is now, let's assume I built my better model for it, like let's say the RMI model two stage for the index. I can use the same model as my histogram. Right? So instead, like, instead of having histogram, which I cannot use as an index, I can use it as my index as a histogram, and the performance penalty is almost not existing. Uh, even better, I can use the same histograms also to plug them into my query optimizer. I can do sorting with them. Essentially, if I have one CDF model, I can use the same model in many, many different places of my database system, from joining, sorting, indexing, query optimization, and other things. Um, the key challenge, though, there is um, it's very simple for one dimension. It's a little bit harder for multiple dimensions. Yeah. So then there's just like conditional probabilities and so on, what you do there. So uh, did it work? Yeah, so back to Peter's question. How about other issues such as uh, locking, logging, compression, and serialization? Uh, logging, locking, compression, and serialization. OK, let me start with compression because it's the best story. Um, so let's assume that your index, given a key, it gives you the position where to find that key. Let's assume my model is in a way built that I can ask the reverse question, given a position, Tell me what key is most likely there. If my model would be perfect, I don't need my keys anymore. It compresses my data, essentially. Right? Because given a position, I know which key I expect there. Why should I store the keys anymore? If the model is not perfect, what I can do is like I delta compress against the expected key at that position. So again, the model becomes my compression technique. So that's compression. Locking, it's like there's a big question about on how you actually make like B trees uh, just like serializable and everything with everything else. Arias is just like the paper everybody hates and still everybody uses. Um, but uh, it's just like it's in, in this way, like because you deal with the inserts in a different way in an approximate fashion anyway, my assumption is that like many of this complexity of uh, locking is not actually needed. 
uh, I think Microsoft is heavily looking into that, I, I heard. So um, they are very, very excited about that. Uh, logging is like, I'm, like transaction processing and logging is still something you will need because you want still serializability guarantees and be everything consistent. So I, I doubt that machine learning, at least I cannot think of an easy way right now to improve that. Well, with that, uh, Tim, thanks very much for an exciting talk. So <laughs> thanks. Our last speaker for this session is uh, Matej Zaharia, and he's a faculty member at uh, Stanford University and previously was at MIT uh, faculty. Um, during his PhD, as you know, he started uh, the Apache Spark computing engine, as well as worked on a number of uh, open source projects, such as Mesos. Um, Apache Spark turned into a company that he landed up founding called Databricks, for which he's the uh, chief technologist as well. He has had a number of awards, um, ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award, um, the VMware Systems Research Award, and the Daytona Graysort World Record. Um, more recently, he has been working on asking the question, uh, to have machine learning and the data scientists be well supported uh, on the data analytic platform, what needs to happen, what are the gaps? Um, and he's going to talk about that today. So after having finished the two talks, looking at how ML or the analytic techniques could help the database internals, we're going to shift gear and listen to him to see what we need to do to make sure in addition to the querying and the other things that analytic systems give, what you have to do special to make it easy for the data scientist. Mate, yes. yep, take it away. All right, thanks, Rajit. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. Okay, so uh, yeah, as Suraj had said, I'm going to talk about infrastructure for usable machine learning. Um, and I'll actually start by talking by, about a bunch of research that we're doing uh, in a lab on this at Stanford called Dawn. Microsoft is one of the generous sponsors of Dawn, so we appreciate that. Uh, and then I'll also briefly put on my industry hat and talk about a type of system that basically hundreds of organizations are building in industry and that there isn't a lot of research about. So I think it's something that we should look at as researchers as well, uh, although I am looking at it in industry. Um, so it's really the golden age of machine learning. There are incredible advances in image recognition, natural language, planning, yada, yada, yada. It's a great story, and they're have, starting to have society scale impact. Everyone's heard that. Uh, but if you look at it a little bit more carefully, uh, this uh, statement comes with a caveat. So it's the golden age of machine learning for the best funded, best trained engineering teams. If, if you are a company you know, with tens of thousands of engineers, it's awesome. Uh, you're happy you can do it but um, it's still very difficult for anyone else to actually use machine learning and have any uh, kind of real world impact. Um, so uh, building machine learning products is still very difficult and very expensive. All the major successes, the things that actually make it into products that make a difference, um, things like you know, Siri or Alexa or Autopilot uh, require hundreds to thousands of engineers just working on them continuously uh, to build and maintain those systems. And the interesting thing, if you look at it, is you know, what are those engineers doing? Are they all sitting around a whiteboard you know, doing integrals and like drawing neural networks? and stuff, they're actually not doing that. Uh, they're not really doing you know, this, the stuff you learn in a machine learning class. Uh, most of the stuff they're doing that's really expensive is data preparation, quality assurance, debugging, and productionization. So that's what is really needed to, to feed these systems, and it's not modeling. Um, and so just a domain expert you know, in, in a specific area can't easily build machine learning products. So if you look at this from a research perspective, it's actually a really interesting thing to look at because it means that the problems that people have in production, you know, any, say, enterprise user you talk with, you ask, hey, are you using machine learning? What's hard? The problems that they face are not the problems that machine learning researchers uh, primarily work on. Those researchers work on settings where you already have a data set, you already have a target metric that everyone agrees is the right one to optimize, and uh, you don't even care about production the model, you just care about like coming up with a training method. And that is not what anyone actually using this stuff uh, for real has to do. So it's this really big mismatch where, you know, as a systems or data management researcher, you can go in and, and, and have an impact. 
Um, we're not the only ones to say this. An another example of a, you know, of a uh, paper that says this is actually this one from Google, uh, where they talk about you know, what's involved in building these systems, and they say only a fraction of the real-world ML systems are the ML code. All this other stuff around it is what takes a lot of time, is expensive, and, and is uh, hard to do. So in the Stanford Dawn project, it's a, it's a, it's a project with three other PIs, Peter, Bayless, Chris Ray, uh, Kunle, and myself. Uh, we're looking at specifically this problem, all the stuff needed around the machine learning algorithms to build production applications to the, enable domain experts to build them. And we want to make it easy to build them without the PhD in machine learning, but also importantly, without being an expert in systems and data management and hardware to get all that other infrastructure around it to work. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about a few pieces of what we're building and Don, just to give you examples. I won't have time to go into a lot of detail, but just what are these problems, you know, at the outside of, of traditional machine learning. Uh, and then I'll also talk, as I said, about some stuff happening in industry in this space. So first thing I'll talk about, so Don, we, we're building this software stack that, stack that sp spans all these phases from data acquisition to production. And the first thing I'll talk about to give you a sense of like, uh, you know, what these problems can look like is actually one of Chris Ray's projects called Snorkel, which is at the data acquisition phase. Uh, and this is about acquiring or using training data. So training data is obviously the key to machine learning. Uh, and the places where it's been most successful are the places where it's very uh, easy and cheap to obtain high volume training data. So you know, image search for images that occur on the internet, not, not you know, for things like medical images. There's so much data, you can, you can look at it, you can build really good models. Speech, people are talking all the time. I'm talking right now, you can record me. You, can, you, know, you could probably build a model of what I'm going to say. Uh, games, you, know, you just play some some video games against yourself, uh, that's good. You'll get lots of data. On the other hand, a lot of the business applications that actually matter are ones where getting uh, labeled data especially is quite expensive. So you know, medical images, you can't just uh, Google them and see lots of x-rays and start learning from those uh, because you know, there might not even be that many patients that have like a certain disease. Uh, document understanding, you know, uh, you, you, you need like say a lawyer to sit down and like read a piece of text and tell you, you know, what the law would interpret it like, and that person's going to cost you thousands of dollars per hour. You can't just get people to, you know, click on things for one cent an hour, um, and so on. So the question in the Snorkel project is how can we leverage data that's expensive for humans to label at scale? And this labeling can easily be, you know, 90% of the cost in many business uh, applications of machine learning. So Chris's project, Snorkel, um, uh, basically looks at a different interface for uh, labeling, which is, uh, which is called labeling functions. So instead of asking humans to just give you labels, you know, look at all these examples and give me a zero or one for each one uh, based on your expertise as a human, uh, this project, Snorkel, asked them to provide labeling functions, uh, which are short programs, you know, from a computer science standpoint, that, uh, that uh, can, can give you a guess at a label but they may not always be accurate. So for example, uh, one, one thing you could do is you could sit down with, say, medical doctors and you know, show them some notes about patients. And instead of asking for each one, like, you know, is it this disease or not, you can, tell, you can ask them, hey, what do you look for that uh, lets you think that this is heart disease? And then you can turn that into a little Python function, like searching for a regex or something like that. And then Snorkel is a training system that can take a bunch of these functions and it simultaneously learns you know, when each one is right and wrong, uh, how noisy it is, and the target model for the data. So it can incorporate this uncertainty from these functions. But the benefit of this interface is just by sitting down and coding a bunch of these functions after you interview a domain expert, uh, you can then apply them to millions of unlabeled examples and documents. So for example, Chris's group sat down with, uh, with researchers in the medical school at Stanford who are doing these projects to automatically understand documents or case notes or things like that. And in just four hours of writing stuff with them, they would match basically uh, months or years of hand labeling, these poor grad students in these fields 
holds like part of their PhD is sitting down for two years to label documents, to, you know, to, to build an automatic system for understanding them. Um, so that's, that's kind of the impact. Obviously saves a lot of time and money. And across a variety of data sets, uh, Snorkel can match uh, uh, basically systems that have been trained on labeled data uh, just by using a bunch of these functions and millions of examples that were not labeled by humans at all before. Um, so it's a, this is a very brief overview. Chris actually has a whole research program around this called data programming, which is about automatically preparing uh, uh, training data um, as a kind of a first class concept. Um, and uh, it's also all open source, so you can find out about it online. But this is an example of you know type of problem that uh, real users of machine learning will face. Um, as another example of sort of a point problem, um, I'll talk about production uh, and in particular serving. Uh, and I'll talk about this project NoScope, which is a joint project between myself and Peter Bayless. Um, so, you know, machine learning models are, are very accurate, uh, especially the new deep learning ones. The, the, in, in many ways, uh, in many cases, the larger the models are, the more accurate they are. Uh, and so people want to deploy them. But so many times the actual inference process uh, is the bottleneck and is going to be the most expensive part. Uh, and this is why you see projects like Brainwave and so on that try to accelerate that inference. Um, so in this project, we looked at using CNNs to do uh, queries on video, something a lot of people want to do. Uh, CNNs are really good at recognizing and labeling objects now, but the problem is these really good CNNs, uh, you know, they can, they, they, they're also expensive, so they can process, you know, one video stream in real time on a, you know, like on a, on a large, you know, uh, server class GPU. That's what's considered real time inference in the computer vision community. And of course, if you have many, say, millions of hours of video or lots of video streams, uh, you don't want to stand up a, you know, huge GPU cluster uh, to monitor it. Even for a modest sized building, this would cost you uh, millions of dollars. So in this project, no scope, we look at how can you get, um, you know, orders of magnitude faster video queries with a minimal loss and accuracy given these kind of black box CNN models that you know are really accurate but expensive. So we use a bunch of techniques to do this, uh, but one of the key techniques is uh, model specialization. So basically, um, we're given this model that's good at recognizing things. We don't really you know, ne necessarily need to know what it does internally. And we're also given a query, like for example, I just want to count cars that are driving by my building. Um, and we're also given a bunch of data to run this query on, which is you know, the specific uh, video frames from the camera outside my building. So what we do with this is we use this big model, we label a few uh, samples from the data with it, and we use it to train a much smaller specialized model. And uh, this model is specialized to my query. It doesn't need to recognize, you know, pandas or uh, motorcycles or things like that. It just needs to recognize cars. It's also specialized to my data distribution. For example, maybe my camera is looking down at the street, so I don't need to worry about cars that are flipped upside down and things like that. So these are reasons why, from a machine learning standpoint, you can have a smaller capacity model that uh, is pretty accurate for this particular query. And the other cool thing about this, this model is we can train it to also output a confidence score. So when it's not sure about the label of a frame, we can always call the original model. Um, and it turns out that by tuning basically the size of this model uh, and, and the confidence thresholds, you can actually capture most of the accuracy of the big model and still save uh, you know 99% of the invocations to it. So we, we also design uh, a cost-based optimizer that can, uh, can solve this problem of how you know exactly which specialized model to use and which thresholds. Um, and basically the results from this are that, uh, you know, depending on your accuracy target, uh, you can get large speed ups often an order of magnitude or more um, over, uh, you know, over these original models and still capture a lot of the accuracy. So we evaluated seven uh, streams in this first paper we had on it. And uh, basically, uh, you know, in, in, um, th this was the best one where uh, you could go thousands of times faster and keep 95% of the accuracy, even in the worst one we could go about an order of magnitude faster. So it's a pretty uh, powerful technique to use for inference and uh, it's, uh, it's easy to apply probably beyond video as well. 
Um, and just as an um, uh, example of extending this further, an ongoing work, which is on archive, uh, we're also extending this to more complex SQL-like queries, where we see a query and we use a mix of techniques, including model specialization and approximate query processing to design a very fast inference pipeline for that query that meets a certain uh, target accuracy. So you can read about that as well to, to see how you can combine these different things. Um, it's, uh, it is, there's a little bit more than just model specialization in that. So that's an example on the inference side of the kind of problems that are needed to actually uh, use these models in production. Um, the next step I'll talk about and kind of the final Dawn example I'll talk about is for software development and the approach uh, we, we have uh, several projects looking at here is designing end-to-end -end compilers that let uh, let you know, sort of productivity programmers get excellent performance and have b basically build a production grade application. Um, so I'll talk about uh, specifically one of my projects here, which is called Weld. So if you look at the um, you know the data science machine learning space, uh, there are a ton of different processing steps you want to do with data, and there's a huge ecosystem of libraries. And to be productive, you know, and also you want to experiment really quickly. So programmer productivity is super important. And the main technique we have for programmer productivity in general is composition. It's the only way that we've made it more efficient to develop software. So ML app developers will compose functions from all these high level libraries, you know, thousands of pi Python packages, R packages, Spark packages, etc. Um, and so, for example, you might use something like pandas in Python to clean up some data. You might use NumPy to, to, to do some operations on it, to normalize it. And then you might use a machine learning library like scikit-learn. And so you'll be composing these functions. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it, it creates um, a, 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 a kind of an, an important problem for optimization, which is even though each individual function you call might be highly optimized, and they often are. You know, these, these numerical routines are uh, very carefully tuned. Your end-to-end -end pipeline could be extremely inefficient, um, and um, that's uh, bad. It means that you know your training will be slow, and then your production serving will be slow. And in many companies, actually, the data scientists have to throw their code over a fence to a production software engineering team that rewrites it to make it efficient. And that's obviously not uh, not going to be. Uh, uh, cheap or uh, and it's not something we want to do. Um, so the the one reason this happens is just because the traditional interface for composing these libraries doesn't give you a lot of room uh, to optimize. Um, in particular, most libraries have these interfaces written in terms of function calls. That's the abstraction in every programming language. Uh, and uh, you know, to, to write a, a library that operates on big data, you give your function a pointer to data that's sitting somewhere in memory. That's usually how you pass things through. So this is an example of a bunch of functions I'm calling in Python. Uh, uh, I'm going to parse and, and then filter some data uh, and then compute an average. And then this is what actually happens. So these functions in, in pandas and numpy are actually all written in C. They're well optimized. But what's really going to happen is I'm going to call each one separately and scan through the data, read it uh, out of memory, and then write it back each time I go through it. So for example, parse CSV, the interface is I give you a pointer to the input string, and I give you a pointer to an output buffer, and you parse it. So it has to do basically two scans through the data. Then drop an A, again, the interface is I give you an array, you give me a new array, it's doing two scans through the data again. And finally, in the mean, I'm going to do a single array. Um, of course, memory access time dominates, especially for big data. So uh, in, uh, you know, in, in a real application, th this can lead to a significant slowdown. And we actually measured in just sort of example workloads and popular frameworks, uh, even though each operator is optimized, they use dozens of operators. And you get these very large overheads from just data movement across them. So in the Weld project at Stanford, what we're doing is we're basically designing a common uh, intermediate uh, representation and a common runtime for data analytics uh, libraries, similar to you know like a language virtual machine, uh, but designed for data parallel code. And the idea is these libraries submit the computation they want to do to um, you know to this runtime engine. It it lazily collects the computation from different libraries, and then it can optimize it for different backends. 
um, and this can lead to significant speed ups as well. So um, this is an example of a Pandas and NumPy pipeline. It's combining operators that are all written in C, uh, but uh, if you turn on weld, uh, you get around a 10x speed up on one thread. Uh, if you turn on cross library optimization in weld, you get another factor of three. And then weld's intermediate language is actually, it's a functional language that's data parallel, so it's, uh, it's trivial to safely parallelize it. So uh, you can also turn on multi-threading uh, underneath these existing libraries and get a large speed up. Um, we have a few papers on the system and also on how we optimize underneath it uh, for real workloads. Um, and then again, so, so just, just to give you a sense of some ongoing work, uh, this, this shows that, okay, optimizing across libraries is useful, uh, and it gives, you know, we try to make this as lightweight as possible to give users a really clean and simple intermediate language they can write stuff in, but it's a bunch of work for them to instrument and modify all these libraries to use it. Um, so actually, uh, in this ongoing work, uh, we're, we're doing weld without weld. We have an abstraction called splitability annotations. Um, and this is a way to enable most of the optimizations that world gives you on unmodified black box functions. We don't even need the source code of your function. So for example, in MKL, the Intel uh, math kernel library, there are all these hand-optimized routines for linear algebra. One of them is actually adding a bunch of vectors. And they're really fast, and if my program just needed to add two vectors, this would be awesome. But my program actually needs to do hundreds of linear algebra operations, uh, and these functions you know, are designed to take the whole thing at once, so it's not that good. Um, so what we can do, and, and you know, this might be my program, it's adding lots of vectors together. What we can do with splitability annotations is we add an annotation to each function that says uh, how we can split up the data to call uh, the function on little chunks of it. This is very similar to vectorized sort of execution in, in, uh, in, in databases with like little batches. Uh, it's just adding that annotation to say how we can split this up. In this case, it means these are arrays that we're adding element-wise so you can split them any way you want into little chunks as long as the chunks have the same shape across them. So we have this type system here for, uh, that can express more complicated ways of splitting. And once you do that, you can actually get these significant speed ups basically from uh, pipelining uh, underneath these functions. So in this case, um, even though MKL itself is multi-threaded, it's well optimized and so on, uh, we get in this case a factor of eight speed up uh, uh, in, in, in various, this is actually in, um, in the simple workload, but also in a bunch of real workloads uh, by pipelining the, the execution of them essentially. And it's pretty cool because we never had to change the code of MKL. Um, so this is still work in progress, but the, the interesting result from this is it can often get competitive uh, performance with systems like Weld or XLA or other compiler-based systems without rewriting these libraries. So it's a super lightweight way to add stuff to an existing library. So that's an example of um, uh, making programmers more productive. Okay. And then the final bit I'll talk about now, putting on uh, my industry hat uh, for a bit, um, is this uh, new type of system uh, for uh, machine learning at industrial scale, which is machine learning platforms. And what's really interesting about this is uh, basically, I think hundreds of companies are building these platforms. It's a real need. There are actually engineering teams building these things, but there's not a lot of research about it, and I think it's an important system uh, to know about if you, if you want to uh, you know, look at research in this field. There's also a lot of unknowns and ways to innovate here. Um, so basically the question here is if you believe machine learning will be a key part of future projects, uh, what should be the software development process for it? So we see this in a lot of the companies that uh, I talk with, for example, at Databricks as well as at Stanford. They said, okay, we had one or two projects that were successful with machine learning, uh, but they took a lot of time and uh, you know the, the, they were expensive to do. How can I have hundreds of teams in my company using machine learning? How can I uh, uh, make it... Uh, uh, you know, not just a one-off like sort of uh, experiment, but something that uh, every team can reliably use. And um, today, un unfortunately, just machine learning out of the box is um, the development for it is very ad hoc. So. Um, 
there are a few problems that make this difficult. Um, so one problem is just uh, tracking experiments. So in, when you do machine learning, uh, you're going to be running many variations of your code. I'm sure in the previous two talks, there were many versions of the models that didn't work, and then finally you saw the one that did work. Um, and today, you know, there's no first class support for this in the systems you do. In software development in general, uh, you have a linear you know, set of commits. You never have like hundreds of branches that uh, you need to track and compare um, with each other. Um, so every data scientist has their own way of managing experiments. It's really important to reproduce results, and it's also very difficult because you, you have dependencies on data sets, on code, on parameters all over the place. And again, there's no automatic way to capture them. And it's also difficult to share and manage models. Actually, for some companies, just tracking which model is deployed, where did it come from, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a non-trivial problem uh, because there could be you know, thousands of models. Um, so we need sort of the equivalent of software development platforms. If you think of something like building a web application or a mobile application, there's so much infrastructure around testing, um, IDEs, load balancers, you know, quality assurance that is just there out of the box. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, but again, machine learning is different because of the wide range of parameters and experiments. Um, so many companies are actually building a new class of system to do this that I'm just going to name ML platforms because that's what they name them. Some of the more prominent examples that people you know, wrote blog posts about are at the large web companies, so Facebook, FB Learner, Uber, Michelangelo, Google TFX. But there are also many of these at smaller companies. Uh, and also, you know, even when I talk to individual machine learning grad students or researchers, they say, oh, yeah, I have like a Python library that tries to record experiments for me. Uh, that's what they're doing. So these platforms, the way these usually work is there's an engineering team that says, okay, here are you know, the 10 algorithms that you can use for machine learning. And if you use one of these 10, we will handle deployment, we'll handle uh, running experiments, tuning parameters, and so on. So we'll handle the whole life cycle. So it's good because they standardize the life cycle. You know that if you work within this platform, it will remember what you did and let you deploy it and let you roll back and stuff. Um, but just having everyone build their own is also a, a disadvantageous. First of all, they each limit it to whatever frameworks or algorithms that company decided to support, and engineers have to add a new one. Um, and second, they're also tied to this internal infrastructure, so you can't really share these things across, um, across companies. So one of the projects that I'm working on at Databricks is actually an open source, uh, open interface machine learning platform that we launched um, uh, back in June this year. It's called MLflow. And I'll just give you a sense of what it can do. But you, know, you can read about this and the other ones online, uh, just to give you a sense of the problems. So one of the things that it does is, um, so by open interface, I mean uh, that um, uh, it's, it's designed to work with you know, whatever infrastructure you have and whatever algorithm, as opposed to like here at and algorithms that we support. So one of the things it does is it lets you package um, reproducible projects. Um, so basically, you can uh, you know you can you can uh, uh, you can declare uh, uh, what dependencies, what environment uh, your machine learning code needs in order to run, and you can also declare parameters that other people from outside can use to call it without having to know the details. Um, and then in your code, you you use these parameters and and uh, you know you do your work. So that means you can package your project and run it again and get the same result later. Um, second um, uh, uh, component it has is experiment tracking. So in your code, you basically use this REST API to log information like, here are my parameters, here are my metrics, here's the model I built. There's also a way of representing a model. Um, and then MLflow basically builds a giant database of all the experiments that have been run for a specific goal. And you can go back and rerun a specific one or compare them or pull out the models and do something with them. Um, and then the third part is handle is deployment, um, uh, which is you know once I've got a model, uh, it actually represents models as uh, basically a function, very similar to a serverless function. Um, and we can then deploy the same model to many different inference tools, such as batch and streaming inference. Um, so it's um, 
you know, it, it, basically it's a, it's a pretty simple kind of workflow system, but it's also something that has a bunch of interesting data management and systems challenges. How exactly should I represent projects and dependencies? How should I represent uh, the experiments? How should I query them? You know, I can imagine queries like I had a thousand different versions of a model and I have a new data point and I want to know which one does best on them. So there are a lot of interesting problems to look at within this space. Um, and if you want to read about this or the other ones, it's just, it, I think it's an interesting thing to look at because again, people are actually building these, like hundreds of companies have independently decided that they need to build a platform, but I don't really see, you know, when I look at a database class or something like that, I don't actually see anyone talking about this class of system. Um, and there's probably a lot that can be done to, um, to, to make these things better. Uh, so many open questions left in designing these platforms. Okay. So that was kind of my brief um, foray into what's happening in industry. So basically to conclude, uh, the limiting factors of machine learning adoption are the development and productionization tools for many users, many real users, especially the ones with um, really high impact biz uh, you know, business use cases, and they're not the training algorithms. And I think this is a really great opportunity for researchers, including data management researchers, because a lot of it is a data problem and they're very unexplored. Um, you can follow the research we're doing on Don in our blog, um, and I'm also happy to chat with anyone about uh, problems in this space. Thanks. So, of course we are uh, running late, uh, but let's ask uh, if you have any questions for Matei. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's take a few. Hi. Yep. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I love everything. Uh, the the. Uh, yeah. I have lots of questions, but but the, in the in the uh, ML platform side of things, right? Uh, I think especially as we start applying this to to um, optimize systems, yeah. becomes particularly problematic, right? Uh, because all of a sudden SQL Server stopped running correctly right. because yeah. Why did it? Yes. something somewhere happened, and now uh, I think that yeah. beyond what you're describing, there seems to be missing sort of a. Uh, the equivalent of a software engineer in practice, right? Yeah, For yeah. software engineering, we have like find bugs and you know code mm -hmm. reviews and all sorts of practices that kind of protect us from the worst mistake and socialize yeah. our understanding of what the system is supposed to do. Um, do you have any ideas yeah. besides tracking the, the, the experiments like how yeah, that's a great into, question. Into a yeah, that's question. that's an awesome question. And yeah, I think it is missing and uh, people are uh, trying to come up with best practices. So uh, just as an example, so these are so some of the things you want to enable with MLflow is to tell people, hey, if you follow this process, like write your code in a project, submit it this way, you know, pull out the model this way, you'll get the following benefits. Uh, but uh, so here are some examples of things I've seen. So one thing I've seen uh, at one large company is they actually have leaderboards for common tasks. So, uh, you know, let's say you're building a better language model or a better image classifier. Uh, there's a single leaderboard in the organization where you can see what this, you know, how others have done over time. You can submit yours and you can compare it. And that's a way that, um, you know, many people can work on a problem and you can kind of see how it's doing. There's a lot of interesting stuff with testing. Um, is my model doing worse than like, say, a naive linear model? Is my data drifting in some way? Are my predictions predictions drifting, is the distribution of the features I see in production uh, different? For example, a common thing is actually you have a bug where like you didn't load one of your features into training or it didn't get transformed the same way. Uh, so that's another practice. The other one that um, is actually hard to talk about but is, is actually even defining the metric you want to change and making it easy to swap metrics. So that's one of the things that we want to do in MLflow is you, if you trained a bunch of models already and now you want to change the evaluation metric, how can we easily let you switch that and basically add a column to that table and compare them on the new metric? Yeah. Other questions? So, so I, I think, um, you know, we kind of don't have the time that we have set for the panel, but this is related to Carlos' question, mm -hmm. and I would ask both you, Andy, and team to comment on it if you have any thoughts on it. This is really the software engineering question, but Sometimes, like for example, the kind of work uh, Andy and and team are pursuing, um, there's always this like old-fashioned database or systems people the fear that something will go wrong in a robustness sense. Mm -hmm. You know um, that yeah, it, it's kind of an average case is great, but suddenly we are going to be exposed to a variance. 
Um, and, and this is possible for any system, but typically mm -hmm. in a distributed system or a database system, there are guardrails that you know that you trip that fuse and we basically say, okay, you know, things mm -hmm. are not going well, right? Yeah. Of course, you don't have to trip the fuse all the time and have some discipline around it. But is this manageable in the world that we are sort of entering? Um, and this is also true when we are building such M ML flow and so on is, mm -hmm. is there any support we get from the system kind of for understanding this or mm -hmm. experimenting with it at last scale? So, you know, this is sort of the only question that I would like all three of you to sort of comment on it briefly if you have any thoughts, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Matthew, you can go first, yours mm -hmm. right here at the podium. Yeah, so. so the question is how to have guardrails for machine yeah. learning or kind of guaranteed behavior. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. I think so far I've just seen people do um, application specific stuff, but uh, basically I think the, the most important things I've seen are having a fallback that is, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's, it gives you lower quality results, but it's, it's robust and you can predict stuff about it. And then also having some kind of monitoring that tells you if things are going haywire. But the way you do that can be different in each system. Um, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I don't I mean, think I, there's I think a, I understand okay. the, the fact that we can sort of go to a safer alternative, yeah. but to detect when we should do that, you know, yeah. is, is sometimes the most kind of challenging part, right? So Yeah, it, it can be. Yeah, I think, again, probably just data drift uh, is the easiest of these yeah. things to capture. Even that is not super easy. But like saying, hey, I'm, my predictions look super different or my input data look super different. Yeah. And, and I think it's even harder, right? It's not just falling back, it's falling back gracefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if mm -hmm. machine learning gives us 20x better than we were before, yeah. falling back to before, it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, so we should you know, smoothly fall back. Yeah, so yeah, that's true. Actually. Just in case you didn't hear Carlo, Carlo's mm -hmm. point was uh, just having a very step function like um, alternative to fall back on is probably not desirable for the system to have some ways to do it gracefully to the extent possible, right? Um, Team and Andy, if you have thoughts, come up here. We'll enable the microphones unless you have given it up, um, and that will allow you to speak here. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you guys still tied up? I don't know. I, I'm yes. I'm still hooked up. Can you <laughs> can you turn these folks all both on or sure? Okay. okay. So, so the only thing I would add from Matei, I think he's right. It's like you have to have a clear objective function to determine when some things are going bad. But the only thing I would add is that. Uh, you know, the exploitation versus exploration, I think being mind, having the algorithms be mindful of what is expected of you at a given time of day or week or month. So that way, if it's at nighttime, when your demand is low, you can be more aggressive about trying different things. But during the day when you have, you know, SLAs you have to meet for transactions or your queries, then you want to be a bit more conservative and not try something crazy. Maybe just not do any tuning at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, like, so my perspective is a little bit different because we mainly want to use machine learning for like improving the systems, which is a different domain than if I want to build a model for detecting images. And I think, like, for example, for the indexing case, we particularly are now looking into techniques where we can bound or find bounds for the errors we can mm -hmm. get in the worst case. So there's this whole field about like smooth analysis, which allows you to get like for certain types of models guarantees. And then you can say, like, okay, in the worst case, I get the following behavior, right? And, like, oh, my model also grows like a B tree. Like, the B tree gives you a strong guarantee because you know, in the moment it goes like out of balance, you rebalance the whole thing to get like the same lookup guarantee again. You can, there's some machine learning models where you can do something similar, right? So, like, there is hope. Uh, <laughs> for the neural net stuff, it's just like all nuts right now. Like, it's, there's not much you can do. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to restrict the type of models. In some domains, you can do that, and some others, you can't. Any thoughts, questions from the audience? Or? Well, thank you all. Thank you very much for a very entertaining session. And. Uh,